My heart is to see God's people full of passion and the fire of God, hungry for His presence on a daily basis, full of His power and having a positive impact on the world and those around them, living a life of freedom and victory. This is Running With Fire. Hi, I'm Tark Barna and welcome to Running With Fire. Merry Christmas. What a fantastic time of the year that we are in right now. I just always so look forward to Christmas, my favorite time of the year. And for me, Christmas starts somewhere around late October so I can stretch it out for as long as possible. The thing that gets me every time is those words, the dawn of redeeming grace. This is a time when our Savior was born. In this message, you are going to be amazed at the incredible number hundreds of prophecies that predicted the birth of Jesus hundreds and hundreds of years before it happened. This message will leave you astounded. Well, before our daughter Jody was born, we didn't know if it would be a boy Or would it be a girl? And of course, that was pretty exciting, waiting in anticipation, not knowing. But we did know we had a 50-50 chance of having one or the other. But nowadays, most people get to find out about 20 weeks beforehand if it's a boy or a girl, if they choose to do so, because women can have scans. But if you went back thousands of years before scans and someone predicted that an unborn baby would be a boy, but also prophesied the birthplace, the time of the birth, the name of the baby, the life they would live, how would they die, and all of this, hundreds of years earlier, we would be looking at something quite extraordinary. And that's how it was with the birth of Jesus. Thousands of years before he was born, the major theme of the Old Testament, which is the first part of your Bible, the major theme was that somebody is coming. Somebody's coming. And every Christmas, there's still a feeling, isn't there? Not now somebody's coming, but somebody has come. He's come, and he came this Christmas time so many years ago, and that Somebody's come, somebody's coming, still overwhelms us today, just as it did the shepherds 2,000 or so years ago. That somebody, of course, was the Messiah, Jesus. And even more incredible is when you think that the Old Testament was finished 450 years before Jesus was born. It was written by 40 different writers over a period of some 500 years and contains around 345 prophecies that are all fulfilled or find their fulfillment in the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. Now that is truly amazing. But what was the big deal? Why, from the time God made the world, was the arrival of His Son prophesied and so clearly mapped out in Scripture by prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. What was so important about this particular birth? Well, the big deal is that this, of course, would be the most important event ever to hit the planet. God knows our greatest need is not world peace. It's not more food to feed the hungry, it's not even better hospitals or better relationships or even better medicine. All of those would be absolutely fantastic. But our greatest need, the greatest need of the world is for a savior to save us from our sins and to rescue us from a lost eternity in a place of darkness referred to as hell in the scriptures. And so when the angels announced the birth of Jesus, this is what they said. Unto you, this day, born in the city of David, 
a saviour who is Christ the Lord. This Christmas, what do we celebrate? Yeah, we feast, we eat, we fellowship, we have friends, we have family. But we're celebrating the birth of the saviour of the world. The one who was born to die, who was born to be king, but who was born to die for the sins of the world, which are your sins and of mine. It really doesn't get any better than that. The birth of Jesus was the most prophesied birth of all time. Compare this to Buddha and Mohammed, both born about 500 years before Jesus, both developed teachings and large followings, but nobody ever predicted the birth of either of them. And there were no prophecies before they were born. In contrast, there are 400, sorry, 345 prophecies in the Old Testament that were all fulfilled by one man named Jesus. No one begins to compare with Jesus. He is the greatest of all. And the conclusion we can come to today is that there is only one true living God. There are not many, and His name is Jesus. He is the only way to heaven. There is no other way. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, Nor is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. His name is Jesus. He alone is our Savior and the Savior of the world. So let's look at what are the odds, what are the chances of Jesus fulfilling 345 prophecies by some kind of coincidence or it just kind of happened? Well, this doctor researched this. His name was Dr. Stoner. And what he managed to do was just look at the odds of eight of the 345 Old Testament prophecies being fulfilled in Jesus. And the American scientific affiliation confirmed that his research and scientific material was accurate. So this had scientific backing. This is not just one man out on his own trying to work something out. And Dr. Stoner came to the conclusion, the amazing conclusion, that the probability of just eight, only eight of the 345 prophecies being fulfilled in the life of one person by chance is so staggeringly minute to the point of being impossible. The chance of this happening has been estimated at one with 17 zeros after it. If there are any mathematicians in the house, why don't you try and work that out You know, one with six zeros is a million, and on and on it goes. And so with 17 zeros, that's not one chance in a million of it all being happened in one man. It's not one chance in a billion. It's not one chance in a trillion. My calculation, I think I might be right, is that it's one chance in 100 quadrillion for just, and that's just for eight, just eight of the 345 prophecies to be fulfilled. That alone is impossible, only eight. And yet all 345 prophecies were fulfilled in in minute detail to the exact letter of what was described in Holy Scripture. This was the most amazing and incredible and prophesied birth of all time. When we celebrate Christmas this season, let's remember that the greatness and the magnitude and the wonder of the man named Jesus, whom we acknowledge today as the Savior of mankind, as the Savior of the world. The fact that these prophecies from birth to death were so accurately fulfilled in Jesus is one of the proofs, just one of the many, many proofs that He is who He says He was. He is who He claimed to be, the Son of God. God come in the flesh into into humanity, into this world. Why? For one purpose. He was born to die. 
He was born to be king, but yes, he was born to die upon a cruel, rugged cross for my sins and for yours. Isaiah 9 verse 6 puts it this way, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. But we can't look at the baby that was born and stop there. You've got to go further and see the son who was given. Because see, Jesus' birth was only the start of his earthly life. It was by his death upon that cross that he completed the purpose for which he came. He completed his life's work and mission of being the Savior of the world. We know it so well, don't we? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him, isn't it amazing? God's invitation is to all humanity. Whoever, black or white, rich or poor, educated, never been to school, lived a good life, the vilest of sinners, it doesn't matter. Our God says, whoever will believe in him will not perish. Of course, that's a lost eternity, but will have eternal life to live in heaven forever. This is the greatest invitation of all time. You can get an invitation to a party and be on that rich list or whatever list you want to call it. You can get an invitation maybe down to Parliament, even the White House, to see the President of the United States. But the greatest invitation of all is offered to every human being, an invitation into a relationship with Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe. And guess what? Your name is on the invitation list. Sometimes we look, but we don't see. Often after I've had breakfast in the morning, like most husbands here today, I give the bench a real good clean. I get out the detergent and the scrubbing material and my elbow grease and I just clean that bench and, you know, I just, I leave it so spotless that I can then comb my hair because it's like a mirror, so clean. And uh, I do this, you know, quite fastidiously, almost religiously because my wife likes to have the house nice and tidy. But often after I've spent 15, 20 minutes just cleaning the bench, My wife comes along and she says, how come there's crumbs all over the bench? (laughs) And I think, I don't believe this. And so I have a closer look, get out the magnifying glass, (laughs) and I find, yes, there are actually a whole lot of crumbs still on the bench. Why? Because I looked, but I didn't see. I didn't look accurately. I looked maybe casually. Didn't give it depth of consideration, which I'm not sure you meant to, but anyway, I didn't. I looked, but I didn't see. What's my point? This Christmas, multitudes of people are going to look at Christmas cards. I bet you have. You've looked at Christmas cards. A lot of people are going to look at nativity scenes. Jesus in a manger. Some will go to school plays about Christmas. Some will even attend church. And they will look, but they will not see. They will see the child who was born, but they'll miss the son who was given, who died upon the cross, and they miss the whole message of Christmas, which is salvation. Isn't it incredible? And we can look Christmas cards with Jesus on it. We can go to plays and celebrate in many ways and yet not really see. 
The Bible says the God of this world has blinded the eyes of people so they cannot see the light of the gospel and the truth of salvation in Jesus Christ. This, missed, this Christmas, don't miss the whole point of what we're celebrating in the offer of salvation to whoever will. Would you look with me in Luke chapter 2, in verse 25 to 30, and we read about this interesting character by the name of Simeon, Luke chapter 2. And it says this, in verse 25, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death until he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him according to the custom, he took him in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace, according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. You might want to call Simeon a bucket lister. Sounds a bit strange, doesn't it, coming from a scripture? Well, I haven't seen that movie, The Bucket List, but I'm told it's about two men with terminal cancer who go off together to fulfill their bucket list, a list of all the things they really want to do before they kick the bucket. Well, Simeon's bucket list had only one thing on it, one item, which was that he had to see Israel's saviour before he died. That was his one passion in life. I've got to see the Savior. Then I'm okay to depart to the next world. Friends, can I say to you this morning that no person on this planet is ready to die until they have seen the Savior. Until they have truly seen Jesus, the Savior of the world. This Christmas, make sure you see Jesus. You see him and receive him as Savior. I was watching a TV program recently, and I just noticed and was intrigued that day after day, they were so excited and celebrating Christmas and talking about it, and obviously just thrilled at the season. And yet I knew as I watched them that they actually had no idea what they were celebrating. They had no idea about a saviour who had been born. Maybe they knew it kind of mentally in their heads, that something wonderful here, but in the depths of their being, they never mentioned that aspect of Jesus coming to die for our sins. And yet they were celebrating away, and I guess there were probably huge numbers of people watching. And one of the things that has staggered me over the years, absolutely amazed me, is that multiplied millions of people celebrate around the globe, they sing songs about Jesus, yet the vast majority have no idea what they are celebrating. How do you get billions of people, world leaders, scientists, professors, doctors, CEOs, people from all walks of life, celebrating an event that they actually don't understand or know very little about? That in itself is a miracle. How how do you do that? And yet... Isn't that the reality? Most nations or many nations across the globe celebrating this incredible time of Christmas. Isaiah 7, 14 also says this, that Jesus would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us. One preacher said this. He said a whole lot of things. But the greatest of all is that God is with us. Isn't it amazing to think that God is with you? You It's one thing to have friends with you, isn't it? Family with you, parents with you, kids with you. I mean, that's just, that's fantastic. But God with us? This is the amazing reality of Christianity is Jesus came to be a friend of sinners. He's your friend. Actually, he likes you. He really likes you. He thinks... There may not be a lot of people who like you. I hope there are. I'm telling you, there's one person who really thinks you are 
absolutely incredible. In fact, he thinks you're so amazing. He said, I, I'll actually give my life for you. I'll die for you. That's how much I love you. For God so loved the world. That's why he did it. Went to the cross. So you're very special to God. And he is with you. He's with us in every circumstance of life. He's with us in the best of times. He's with us in the worst of times. And I've been through some times. Great times, and I celebrate that God's with me. But I've been through some dark times, as we all have. The amazing thing is that sometimes in those dark times, God is nearer, closer, more personal than in those wonderful mountaintop times. You see, the God we serve is not a deity way out there, distant, you know, with an angry face and a stick in his hand and ready to punish you at any mistake that you might make. Some people, that's the way some people see God. A lot of people live in an in incorrect fear of God. But not with Jesus. He's the lover of our souls. You know, though, he, though you fall, though you fall, you'll not be cast down. He'll lift you up again. Though you make mistakes, he won't cast you aside. He'll, he'll st stand with you and help you and guide you and bless you. He just loves us so much. Whatever we're going through this Christmas, and from here on, out, here on out, we're not alone. He is Emmanuel, God with us. I don't know how your year has been. Maybe it's been a great year. Maybe it's been a terrible, maybe a dreadful year. You may have stood at the gra graveside of a loved one. You may have lost your job your home, your health, even your marriage. And there'll be people sitting here today that fit every one of those categories. It's been a dreadful year for them. And in all those hardships, they can leave us feeling utterly alone. But we're actually not. Emmanuel, God is with us. In his own words, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Aren't they great words? Some people leave us, don't they? Forsake us. Even some that we thought would be with us forever, trusted friends and companions, but they, just the nature of it, desert us. And maybe we've deserted people as well. But not our God. He's your friend today, and he'll be your friend forever. For all eternity, it is never going to change. His love for you is not conditional. He loves you on your best days when you've been nice and kind to everyone. He loves you just as much on your worst days when you've been mean and nasty. Unconditional. This is amazing grace. <laughs> this is a wonderful God that we have come to know and we have come to serve. Our losses and our pains are heightened often at Christmas time. That's why Christmas can be really difficult for some people. The pain just seems to go higher. The loneliness seems to increase. The discouragement seems to just be more than at other times of the year. It's just something that happens around Christmas because we see everyone else celebrating. But in all of this, remember God is with us and he can comfort us, he can strengthen us, he can encourage us. God's gift of salvation is for everyone. It really is. But we have to remember it's limited to those who receive him by faith. John 1 verse 12 says, To all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. It doesn't say all those who heard about him had the right to become the children of God. It doesn't say all who agreed with his teachings or all who lived good lives, all who regularly attended church, or all those who did incredible good deeds. No, friends, it's not what it says. Salvation only comes to those who believe in him and receive him as their savior.
He was a prisoner being taken out to die. As he rode along in the death cart, his heart was heavy at the thought of death, and nothing could cheer him up. The gallows were near at hand. Then a man came riding up to the cart, bearing a free pardon. The man's eyes opened as if he had been risen from the dead. His chair returned. All gloom was chased away by the man bearing this pardon. And he declared that day he had never met a more wonderful person and that nothing should ever be dearer to his heart than the pardon he received from the death cart and the gallows. He would treasure that moment and that person for the rest of his days. Friends, I was once in the death cart, lost in sin and darkness. Death and hell loomed large before me. But then Jesus came with a great pardon. And I was thrilled beyond what words could possibly express at the nail prints in his hands and in his feet and his pierced side that I heard those words, all your sins are forgiven. I received Jesus into my heart. It was the greatest moment of my life when absolutely everything changed. Nothing, nothing, nothing will ever compare with my salvation. Jesus has no peer. He has no rival. He is the greatest of all. I was a guilty, condemned sinner on my way to hell in the death cart. But because of the birth and death of Jesus, I am free. My destination is heaven. Now that is the greatest story ever told. Merry Christmas, my friends. I really trust that this message has inspired you, but also increased your faith and trust in Jesus. He is who he says he is. He is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. If you don't know Jesus and you'd like to, why don't you pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, I thank you that you love me and you died upon the cross for me. I confess my sins and ask you to forgive me. And now I invite you to come into my heart as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Please tune in again next week. Thank you for watching Running With Fire with Tark Barna from Church Unlimited. For more great free content, visit runningwithfire.com. You can send us your prayer requests and stream on-demand TV and radio episodes. You can also connect with Tark Barna on social media for regular inspiration. Church Unlimited meets in many locations across New Zealand. You are welcome to join us for a church service. Find us at churchunlimited.co.nz.